Okay. The hope is that I have everything after all working. All right. Um, <coughs> one more little lecture um, on a topic which is useful to know about adaptive control. We've done a whole bunch of things. We have done optimal control. We've done common filtering. Adaptive control is another part of it about how to learn systems more automatically. You've noticed maybe by now that whenever you work on a robotic system, a simulator, whatever you're doing, there's a lot of parameters to twiddle. It's kind of annoying. And at some point, it would be wonderful if things would work automatically. And this is essentially what adaptive control is kind of um, addressing. How can I basically adapt to a system? How can I make a system behave in a particular way without that I have to do everything manually, but rather I have an autonomous system which learns by itself? So this is kind of connecting also to what is called learning control. And learning control and adaptive control make a distinction that learning control usually means that you are allowed to do trial and errors. And the errors mean you can fail, and it's not catastrophic. While people in adaptive control usually are very proud on creating systems which learn automatically without ever failing. Which kind of, if you think in terms of, of you're up in an airplane, uh, is a healthy little thing to do since you don't want trial and errors on your airplanes when the adaptive controller kicks in. There is adaptive controllers and many things working, but only on a small scale. There's no big learning systems or big adaptive controllers on kind of normal robots running. People make little tidbit examples. They, they show that certain things are feasible. But making these things work in general, it turns out to be really a lot of work and a lot of worries about that something goes wrong. So I just want to give you a, a picture of that, since there's a couple of useful concepts in there, from linear regression to standard adaptive control to the optimal functions, again, which you've seen before. And I think it's a nice topic to know about. It's not very hard conceptually, as we'll see, to get going. It is much harder to put it into complex nonlinear system than make it work. So this lecture essentially, I think, will then pretty much conclude the lecturing part. The next time we'll um, start talk about what we do for the project, and you get primarily time for the rest of the month to get projects and homework and all these things going. We try to prepare the nows for you that you can actually, in the end, put your project on the nows. But it will start initially with a simulator. The idea is essentially to, to make you now robot stand on one foot, and maybe put the other foot down, stand on the other foot. If you can do this back and forth, you actually have a simple little walking movement where you can go back and forth. How far this is going to work, I have no idea. <laughs> you, you notice by now that working with a simulator, particularly this one has just been programmed, there's still some idiosyncrasy. Sometimes things may go unstable. Your robot may explode. What kind of good stuff may happen? So we'll just have to work that out. Um, is anybody here who has a unsuccessful now some simulator? Yes. Okay. Now you need to bug me, okay? You need to get this sorted out or you need to get on another computer. There's certain errors which I have not comprehended yet. There's one one email this morning was about some core dumping, which I looked at, um, I forgot who it was yesterday. And this has to do something with the threading, and I have no idea where this comes from, but we'll hopefully can debug it down. Let's just take a moment long. Okay, get another operating system. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Interesting. It's an interesting learning curve for, for me as well. Okay, let's get into this. Adaptive control. So what is it what you want in general? And this is kind of more the textbook phrases. So you want to characterize the desired behavior of the closed loop system. I want that my control system behaves like blah. Which is, what does that mean? Well, let's assume you are a tank for a moment. But you want to be as dexterous as uh, a little child. So can you make a tank maybe pushing with its barrel, whatever the, the, the shooting thing is, and manipulate an aim? So that would be like, I want, this is a tank but I want to get rid of the tank. I just want it to behave like a very dexterous, lightweight, delicate little child. That's kind of what this means, characterize desired behavior of the closed loop system. You, have a, you want the system to be like something, which it is not naturally. Uh, but for a particular task, it may be good. So this, again, you can take kind of all kinds of manipulations out. If you're hammering away, you don't have to be very dexterous. But if you do fine manipulation, put basically a thread through a needle, that requires a complete different way of, of 
setting your gains and, and, and how things feel. And then you basically have to figure out a suitable control law with some adjustable parameters, assuming that you cannot make up the control law by yourself. And last not least, you have to find a mechanism of adjusting the parameters and implementing them. So this is kind of the standard scenario how to get going to achieve. And there is two main ways how to do that, which are fun to look at. The one is called model reference adaptive control. And the idea is essentially pretty much what I just told you now. I basically make up a model and say, let's assume I have a desired trajectory. And I would send this to the model. So the model might be a simple um, spring damper system, linear spring damper system. And I can choose the mass and this damping and this, um, whatever offset term is in this particular case freely, just whatever I want. And then basically, if, if assume that this is actually my control system, and I would give this a desired um, trajectory, then this would create a desired, that would create an output, which is kind of just from this model system. And now I want that my real robot system kind of behaves exactly the same way. So when I basically give it a little push, it will give in gently for it, despite it might be a big clunky robot. And this is what this adjustment mechanism is supposed to do. And basically, this adjustment mechanism is supposed to change your controller such that this robot behaves like that. These kind of uh, diagonal lines usually mean the learning in most of the control blocks. Okay. Now, how does this work? Well, we can just play a little game and see how, how far we can get with this. And for that, it, it's really fun to see how this is developed in some simple control systems. So here is a favorite way of writing rigid body dynamics. That's what the control theoretician or adaptive control people or optimal control people like to do. So this is rigid body dynamics. And you know, what is he talking about? Remember rigid body dynamics, the way we looked at it originally looked like, I think, M Q double dot plus C of Q and Q dot times Q dot plus G of Q equals tau. This is how we introduce rigid body dynamics. So how do we get from here to there? Well, we can just solve for Q double dot and bring everything on the other side. So we have tau minus C times Q dot minus G of Q. And then we have to get this M minus one matrix in there. And we can multiply this out, which becomes then M minus one times minus C Q dot minus G of Q. And we get another term, which is going to plus M minus one times tau. Okay, now if you compare this, that would basically say this term here becomes this term. This is not the same G, that's annoying. Um, maybe you can make it a little bit distincter, make it a capital G for the second. Okay, better. So we have this G term corresponds to this M term, and this F of X term corresponds to this entire term. And sure, this is a second order system. We do know how to make a second order system a first order system. So that actually fulfilled it. This is what is called the control affine system. It's control affine because the commands are not part of a nonlinear function. They're linearly multiplying this G of X matrix. Okay, it's just words. It doesn't mean too much. It's just how people talk about that. But this system in general is very nice for analysis. So that's why people like to write it this way. And rigid body analysis importantly is part of that, and some other systems are part of that as well. So, you can just write this down here one time. So this is a control affine <coughs> system. Okay. Good. Um, let's try to develop an adaptive control off of this. Very simple way. Um, and let's do this on a simpler system. So, I don't want too many terms in there. I first this is meant to be vector matrix space. Let's make it a purely scalar system, which is x dot equals f of x. So 
simple as two, super simple. Okay. And what we're going to assume is we want to have an adaptive controller which figures out this F term automatically. Okay. We assume we don't know it. So it's a model essentially, but it's unknown. And we want to estimate it automatically on the fly while never screwing up. So the control R down here is then basically simple inverse control R. So the U equals, we try to cancel with a model. The model is going to be F hat of X. Then we get the regular desired trajectory, X dot, and the simple P controller, X minus X desired. Is that the right way? It's a minus F, X one. Okay. And the next step we're going to do is we need to make some assumptions. We need some parameters to adjust. So we're just going to parameterize F hat to be something which is X times theta hat. Okay, super simple, a very simple linear function. So normally, so this is really scalar here. So this is really boringly simple. Normally, it would make something slightly more complicated, and you would have um, something like some basis functions phi of x times transpose times some parameter vector theta. That makes it nonlinear more complicated. I come back to this for a second later. But right now, let's keep it super simple and simply realize that this is the simplest case of an inner product of basis functions with some parameter vectors as it's been called. Okay, cool. So we need to figure out those parameters, theta hat, and we want them to become as close as possible to the true theta parameters. So we actually assume that this function f of x is really truly modeled by something like theta times x. So this is the true parameter. Well, this is our estimate. OK. Good. So this is the setup. That's our control. So let's make some space and keep things around. So the controller is useful to keep around. Actually, let's write it out with a parameter vector right away. It's x times theta hat plus x dot desired minus k times x minus Good. And the next thing we're going to do is basically we plug this into our control system. So let's write this out one more time. This comes in the next slide. I hope so. Okay, good. So we get now x dot equals f of x. f of x was x times theta plus this entire control is all x times theta hat plus x dot desired minus k times x minus x desired. Okay. So this is all plugged in. Now define some errors, regular things. So the error is going to be oops. E equals x desired minus x. And we also define a parameter <coughs> error, which is theta squiggle. And I don't know why the control people like squiggles, but they do a lot of squiggles. That is going to be theta minus theta hat. So the true parameter minus the estimated parameter. All right. Cool. And then we can write this in slightly a more elegant way. So what, what's happening is here we basically replace this with our error. This here is going to be E. This is nice. What else can we do? We can also basically bring, for instance, the x desired over to the left. Then I have x dot. Right. You can do this nicely on the whiteboard. x dot minus x dot desired. Yep. 
rid of this here. This is going to be E dot. And last but not least, I have this term here, which I can simplify to x times theta squiggle. And this is how basically we get that system down here in the end. E dot equals so the aerodynamics, as people call it. X times theta squiggle is OK, minus K times E. Perfect. Everything in there. Good. So this is the aerodynamics. Now that we come back to this nice concept of Lyapunov function, in case you still remember from this one little example we did when we derived a gravity contr uh, compensation controller. So remember, how did it work? A Lyapunov function was, in an abstract way, a function spans over the state space, so the horizontal plane is my state space. And in this case, I can, for instance, use a state space my um, error, and I could use my parameter error, see that squiggle. And what I would find, I want to basically put a parabolic function, or something like a parabolic function, a potential function, such that it is minimal at the point of interest. See, so that's not particularly well drawn here, since the point of interest is that the errors are zero in my work, so I should actually fix that. And we go here, we want the ball go literally to the origin. And this is my potential function V. The idea is if I can find a way that VV dt, the time derivative of V, is always zero under my control law, and there's no other way than that I always go down in the ball until I hit the bottom of the ball, which by definition is where I want to be. So that was this whole Lyapunov function approach. Again, in our world, it's just simple parabolic functions, or just a parabolic balls. So we do exactly that. Let's create a ball. So we create this V. And you have to make it up. Remember, this is something which is not given to you. But in general, working with kind of quadratic things works most of the time quite nicely. So you want basically um, zero error. So we take the error squared here. And to anticipate that we have to do differentiate, we put just a one half in here. This is for, just for decoration of making my math simpler. The one half can be left out. We can have a factor two in, in some of the equations left. And there's another term, which is quadratic. And I could just make this trivially theta squiggle square. OK? And put one half in front of it. That would be feasible as well, but I actually anticipate that something else is going to happen. I didn't anticipate this right away. In reality, is I do my math one time, and then I go back and fix it and do it one more time. And then it becomes exactly what I want. I don't want to do this to you. So there is a gamma gain parameter in there, which is minus 1, just for fun, inverted. Um, so it's a scalar in our case. So this here is written as, <coughs> as if it were a matrix and a vector equation. We could also just write here 1 over gamma if we want to. Doesn't matter. Let me speak a little bit with the slides and make it here gamma minus 1, just for fun. Doesn't really make a difference. Uh, we'll work with it. Cool. That's our Lyapunov yeah. function. And we do the entire story, which we have to do. We have to take the time derivative of the Lyapunov function and see what comes out of that. So that's the problem. It's a fun little example. It's very easy to follow. And gives you, again, exactly the feel of what it takes to do a stability proof and at the same time derive actually a adaptation law. You will see how this pops out. It's not clear at this moment. OK, V dot equals simply one half goes away, it is e times e dot plus one half goes away again. We get the time derivative, so theta squiggle times theta squiggle dot times this gamma minus one. I hope this is correct. Yes. Good. And why did I write this twice? OK, I see. Um, the next thing was to look at gamma squiggle dot. <coughs> gamma, sorry. Theta squiggle dot. Comes from here. So let's look at the time derivative of this guy. It would be e 
theta dot minus theta hat dot. Except that theta dot is our true parameter vector, which doesn't change. We don't assume the system changes over time. So this here becomes actually zero. So this means theta squiggle dot is actually minus theta hat dot. And this is essentially what happens in this line here. So we can basically reply, replace this here with theta hat dot and make it a negative sign. Okay. So this got us to this point. Now we have to plug in the error dynamics, which we derived in some previous equation up here. So E dot equals X theta squiggle times minus K times E. So we basically plug this here in. This is going to be X theta squiggle minus K times E. And we multiply it out. This is essentially what's happening here, I hope. Um, minus X times squiggle. Well, there you go. Let me see. Anything wrong with my minus signs? Here is a minus sign, and I don't have this minus sign. So it's very irritating. So what am I doing wrong? E dot was minus k. So it should be all minus. I didn't bring this over the right way. Okay. Oh, this here is minus e dot. See, that's my problem. I had this written like this. This is minus e dot. And I have this here, and this here is also not e. This is minus e because it's x minus x desired. I defined my error as x desired minus x. Small subtleties of life, which will remember. Good. So the slides are right. And I have minus signs here. Two times. Plug this in, multiply it out, and get all these terms. And let's see. Is there anything exciting happening? Let's look at the final result of that. So I get finally that V dot equals minus E times X times theta squiggle minus K times E square minus theta head um, oopsie, times theta, theta squiggle times theta head dot. Okay. Times gamma to the minus one. Now the important thing is I want this to be less than zero. Here we go. That's what I want. Okay. And if I don't achieve that, I'm very unhappy. Okay. And what you do then? We have something like this in a Laplace function. You go and study every term by itself. So this term. Can I guarantee that this term is going to be less than zero all the time? I have no idea of what sign my error is going to have. I have no idea what sign my state is going to have. And I have most likely no, no idea of what sign my theta squiggle is going to have. So the answer is nada. Don't know. This one, ke square. K was my gain. My gains I choose positively. E square is guaranteed positive. So this here is guaranteed less than zero all the time. So this is a friendly term. I like this. And then I have again another term with theta squiggle, which is my error in parameter, which I don't know which sign it has, multiplying the velocity of the adaptation of my parameter. No idea. Only know that this gamma, which I'm choosing, is, is positive. So again, I have no idea what this is. Cool. But I still have a choice to do something. Since I can actually choose in this law that how I want to adapt my parameter. Okay, so very simple. I simply decide that minus e x theta squiggle minus theta squiggle theta head dot times gamma minus one. I want this to be zero. Brilliant, isn't it? So this is the choice I have, and I'm just exercising this choice. 
every country. So this is this thing. And now I just all, all I have to do is I simply solve for theta hat dot, which is very straightforward to do. And this is basically what you get. You get theta hat dot equals minus gamma times the error in basically in tracking that's desired minus x times the current <coughs> state x. With this adaptation law, I can guarantee that v dot is always less than zero. Thus, my control system will control following a desired trajectory simultaneously adjust theta hat, the parameters, until it reaches perfection. Kind of nice. So we just created a very simple control system which is guaranteed stable all the time and the parameters will go to the optimal that means zero solution and in, in error or the optimal parameter which is a true parameter. So this is all great. That's theory in super simple system. In practice now this becomes way harder since as you notice there's all kinds of assumptions which I had to make. So one big assumption was this parameterization of my dynamics. So I made this assumption that f can be modeled as x times theta, which is an assumption, which may not be true. If I have a nonlinear system, this becomes way more complicated, as I mentioned, and I have to go to actually to something like a feature vector phi of x transpose times parameters theta. And then there will be a modeling error which will be around. This modeling error will be some way in my Lyapunov function and create terms which I cannot control in what their signs are. But then people try to do it. They have some term in here which you cannot get rid of. You try to dominate it with another term which is guaranteed negative. You need to make some other term which is really big, which kind of slaps you into submission and get things going. And now you get into this kind of voodoo game of kind of making assumptions, figuring out whether these assumptions are physically correct, and, and go back and forth and develop these controllers. So it becomes unfortunately much more hairy and much more annoying how to prove that these things will actually be guaranteed stable. They will, they, it's, the reality is they are not, okay? They are only stable within certain assumptions. You assume, okay, you are not perturbed more than blah, and they will have a modeling error which is bounded. There's all kinds of bounding assumptions which people have to make. But you can create nice controllers. So here's, here's a controller which learns some nonlinear function. Is that actually running by itself or I have to press one more time? Um, so this is, this, let, me, let me show you. So this is maybe, um, this is some old project from a couple of years ago. Um, where we were just trying with general machine learning with basis function approaches, learn a nonlinear function. So this is this f hat term again, that, this kind of uh, model which I have here. And this time it's a nonlinear model and you create a controller, the basis function now very similar to this, this parameter vector here and some additional um, ingredients to make it learn automatically. This, oops, nonlinear function which seems to not even play. Does it play? Oops, yeah, it does. So that's a very, very fast learning system which creates actually this nonlinear function which looks like a Gaussian within basically a few seconds automatically. And you can still prove that it's stable, but now with these kind of assumptions that you have not too much perturbations or whatsoever. The system which can actually creates these basis functions automatically, puts them down where it needs that and, and adjusts them on the fly. Um, so we tried these kind of things a long time ago. It was a project for the Air Force. And they had worries that some of the airplanes, they fly around and suddenly the airplanes change their dynamics. I don't know why this would happen. Maybe someone shoots a hole into the wing. I don't know, something like that. And they wanted to basically see, can you have adaptive controller which can rapidly adjust to the change of dynamics and catch the airplane and control it? And you can actually. So if you basically, at least in simulations, you go to about 90% survival rate versus it was like 10% before. Nobody ever flies these things. Um, so it's all theory and, and simulations. Cool. So this was one branch of um, adaptive control where you basically create these online um, learning adaptation systems which basically you do control and you adapt at the same time and all is put together in one beautiful control law and you can guarantee that things work out. This is the ideal. If you could do this for everything like a walking controller for, for complicated driving cars or whatever, it would be fabulous. It's just very hard. Um, there's another 
adaptive control mechanism, which is called self-tuning regulators. And don't ask me where all these names come from. They're kind of weird sometimes. Um, so this system works a little bit different. Again, you have a controller which controls a robot. And there is some system which basically changes the controller. And the idea here is a little bit different. What you're going to do is essentially you estimate something about the world, most of the time actually a model. And then you use this model, which you get from real data, and plug it into the controller design as if it were the true world. And this is also called the, the certainty equivalence principle, that you actually believe that what you have been modeling is true. And based on that hallucinated or estimated model, I should say, you can design a controller. Typical example is actually LQR control. Let me just get back to that. LQR control, remember, was based on the simple linear system AX plus BU. And we created a controller, which basically in MATLAB would like LQR of A, B, and some weight matrix is Q and R. These were the two weight matrices which are in a con optimal control of, which says I want X transpose QX plus U transpose RU to be my cost function of some point. And you could, for instance, say, I don't know A. And in this case, you could basically simply say, oh, let's just collect some data from the system and estimate A. And if you do this right, you, this becomes a linear regression problem. And then you basically get from some regression process, and I'll show you in a second how this could work, you get some A hat. And then you basically compute your LQR control law with A hat. So this is exactly this appro approach which you see here. I may estimate the parameter or some parameters with whatever machine learning or other process, and then I plug it into my controller design and hope good stuff comes out. Which may go wrong. So these things are much harder to prove in terms of their stability properties. The other one is kind of the nice, clean, adaptive control way, which unfortunately is not as general as you want it to be. This is a more estimation way, machine learning way, with not so many stability proofs. There is actually ways to combine these two things in an interesting way and still create stability proofs, but it's more complex. OK. Um, that was the basic idea. And we can do one simple example. So how to estimate a robot model from data. And let's start to exactly this here, for instance. We have this linear system, and we want to estimate something. And what I need in order to make this a estimation problem is I need to make it the linear system right now, I just made it to do it a regression problem. So actually I want to do it like this equals um, let's see a new system is A and B, which is multiplied by X and U. These can still be the little partitions. So the matrix is in a partition form, a big matrix. So I still get A times X plus B times U if I multiply it out. But now we have basically here some input parameter, and basically here some things I have to estimate. So this needs to be estimated. And now I can try to formulate this such that I can collect data. I'll show you a regression in a second how this looks like. But essentially what I'm going to do is take your robot, you're in a particular state, and you just create some quote unquote arbitrary motor commands. You don't get totally arbitrary motor commands. You don't want to create like Gaussian noise or something terrible like this. And if you feed this to a robot, it will not be happy. But you could just make it sine wave, for instance, or complicated sine waves. That means sine waves is multiple frequency components, so higher order sine waves. And from this, you basically start collecting data points. You put in an x at time t, a u at time t, and out comes an x dot at time t. You can create a lot of data like this. And from a regression or a statistical point, a simple statistics point of view, this becomes a standard problem where you say, I have a system which has an output y, which is generated from some, uh, some 
a matrix with some parameter vector, you know, some state vector x times some parameter vector theta. This is really what it boils down to from a minimalistic point of view. And you basically want to estimate these parameters theta, which in our world would be the A and B, A and B matrix. And the way you estimate them is somehow that um, your theta are such that when you predict the Y, you predict it as close as possible to what you got from your learning data. So people often call the learning data that actually T, so T is the target. This is what you have been observing. So that would be now in an empirical way. This here would become my T, and this here becomes my combined vector X. And um, what I want when I predict, do I use Y as okay? And every for every data point I have is I want that T minus Y squared is minimum. So that's the squared error. And I sum this over all data points which I've been collecting. I can put a one half in front of it and call it a cost function which I would like to minimize. Okay, typical squared or least squared approach, squared error. Cool. The nice thing is if you see that you can reformulate my dynamical system from this first view to this view, which is now pure parameter vector and some, 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 some state vector to something which becomes a standard linear regression problem, then you can also solve it with linear regression. I am not sure how many of you know linear regression, but it's actually super simple. So here's just the one slide you need to understand linear regression. And it's, it's the it's a wonderful, most trivial algorithm to implement. Okay, so you assume in general, like this is now a scalar output. You can also make it a vector valued output if you want. Um, you see some output is generated by some parameter vector W squiggle transpose times X squiggle plus some offset W0. So where does this come from? It's just the generic idea you have X, Y, <coughs> and this is a line. So this is the model which you care about. This here would have slope W and an offset of W0. Okay? Standard, simple, that year I'm sure you saw in school at some point. Okay, because it is annoying to work with this offset, people simply absorb the offset in the in the first term and write simply this is W transpose times X. And now my X is my original X plus a one as an additional component and my W vector has the W zero in there. This is just how to absorb um, the offset in complete notation and forget about this additional additive term. You do make an assumption that here is a additive noise process, epsilon which is important. So this epsilon is basically capturing that there is noise uncertainty of whatsoever in your model. And um, you just live with that and you try to basically, it, it, it just models some level of error, which is there. You assume epsilon is a mean zero noise process as we have in the common filtering. That's very important. So that means you get data points from this line which are not right on this line, that would be nice, but they're a little bit noisy, like this. And you want to fit a line through that. Cool. So you go basically take a squared error criterion now in vector matrix notation again, if I have a vector of all my data points, oh, that's important actually. So let's put all our, the data which I've been collected, let's put them into a big matrix X. So every row of the matrix has one data point which I collected from my experimenting, and an equivalent target T, so what I would like to have is in this big T vector, okay? This is just, again, making everything nice, compact, and linear algebra. And if you have that, then my error criterion becomes now T minus Y. This is a vector transpose times T minus Y times one half. This is my cost function. Okay, this is just writing the sum of squares 
in, in, as an inner product of big vectors. Cool. Then you have this, then you can basically plug in the model. So the prediction at every moment of time now is y equals x times Michelin. So transport error. This is my prediction of my model. W is what I want to find. I want to find W such that T minus Y is minimal. Okay, good. Um, this is how it's derived. I'm not sure how much you want that. It's beautiful. It's just taking the cost constant J and differentiating with respect to W. It is in the end very simple vector matrix calculus. There. The W in there, you basically um, this is a squared form, so you, you can look into bilinear transforms or bilinear functions in, in the Siciliano uh, appendix, how you take derivatives through those, you solve it, and what you get out in the end is just the standard least squares um, result. So that the optimal weight vector is the pseudo inverse um, multiplying the y target cheese. So, target. Okay. So that comes back to one of the interpretations. What is the um, right pseudo inverse actually doing, the right pseudo inverse basically said, I have more data points, so basically I have more constraints than I have parameters. And I, I, I try to pick these parameters W such that I minimize the reconstruction error of my Ys on my target. Okay? Good. So this is very simple. So implementing this in MATLAB is literally one line. It does it for you. And you've done this largely in, in homework number one. Um, let's see what is good about least squares. So this is the pseudo inverse. We just talked about that. Important is that x transpose x is invertible. If it's not invertible, you get into trouble. And that's actually not so trivial. So it's fine in this little toy example I show you here with two dimensions on a whiteboard. Um, if you bigger system which may have 100 dimensions or something like that, it's actually non-trivial to collect data from your robot which makes this matrix truly invertible. It's very easy to make it very efficient. And that's actually, this is a piece of art how to collect data from complicated robots like a humanoid robot which has 100 mm -hmm. degrees of freedom, um, how to basically collect this data and then do proper model estimation. If you have problems with invertibility, there's tricks how to stabilize that matrix. This is what is called ridge regression. You add an identity matrix and a small factor gamma multiplying the identity matrix, and then you invert it. But this is a little bit of fudging. It's basically making the matrix inversion stable, but it's actually biasing your results when you regress your W. So this is just standard machine learning basic things. Not so important right now. It's just good to have these remarks at least. If you have multiple outputs, that means we just currently consider that y is a scalar output. It can also be a vector output. Then basically the story remains the same. You now get a matrix of targets. We could call it capital T. That looks like T11, T21, T231, blah, blah, blah. The matrix like this, the y's look similarly, and the uh, vector of weight becomes a matrix as well. But otherwise, the computation stays the same. It's no difference. Let me see. How much do I want to do this? Forget about this one. This is kind of the standard way of looking. Why are the springs missing? Fine. The, the swiftly springs, I've forgotten where these springs are. Um, let's, let's recreate that. So, 
So the typical interpretation of what linear regression is doing is you have a bunch of data points. You put a line in there and just imagine there are springs attached of every data point to this line. Make it a, a kind of a rigid bar that you put in there. And the physical intuition is essentially that this bar just finds the equilibrium where all these springs are basically the forces of all the springs get balanced. Okay. Here's something actually which is important. If you have a tiny, tiny moment of statistics, my springs, okay, fine, my springs are not so perfect, but my springs are meant to be vertical. They're going vertical. They are not going orthogonal to the line. That is actually quite important. We assume in linear regression that y equals some x transpose w plus epsilon. So the noise can only be in the vertical y direction. It is not in the x direction. Okay? Now, Interestingly, when we play robotics, our state vector sometimes has to be estimated too, right, by the presence of a common filter. So that becomes a noisy guy as well. It means that x is actually generated from some true x plus another epsilon x process. Now, the regression, linear regression does not absorb noise in the x. Uh, component. That is the wrong model. There's much more about well, There's different models which can do this. Factor analysis is one of them, but that's a statistical model which is completely different. And I wouldn't be able to develop that as well. So, interesting little problem. In many robotic systems, we have noise in our state. The position may be still okay. Velocities after numerical differentiation to get it, definitely. If you even have accelerations in there, big time noise. And if you have noise in there, then your regression result will not be optimal. Actually, what's going to happen in most of the cases is you will underestimate the slope of, 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 the, uh, of your regression and make it flatter than it's supposed to be. So you will, have, you will be biased and have errors. And that's really an interesting problem where you need to figure out how much data filtering you can do to get X as noise-free as possible and whether you can then assume that you can work with this quote unquote denoise X without really considering that there might be a noise process in it. If you have to consider the noise process, your estimation becomes way more complicated. There's no close form solution to that. It becomes what is called expectation maximization algorithms and the factor analysis to sort it out. It can be done, it's nice, but it's not as pretty as that little linear regression equation which we had before. Okay. Another fun thing to know about is the Sherman Morrison Woodbury theorem. It's such a nice name. Or the matrix inversion theorem. It turns out that this linear regression, that is really cool, has a recursive, that means point by point estimation method, um, which is the same as what we had before in our closed form solution. But the closed form solution was this. Okay? That essentially assumes I gave you n data points, you form those matrices and vectors, and then you solve it. Okay? But how about a robotic process um, that you get one data point every time step, and you want to basically keep on working with that? And for that, it's something which is called recursively squared regression. And these are the update formula for recursively squared regression, where basically P becomes inverted covariance matrix, as people call it. And it turns out that you can basically, if you get a new data point, you have to obviously update this thing. So there is a, you now have to put little time indices in or data indices in on that. And it turns out you can actually figure out Pn plus 1 in a relatively efficient way. So the dumb way is obviously you keep a big data set around, you always add um, the new data point and you do the entire matrix inversion again. Now this is a n cube expensive process to do. 
Instead, you can actually make this a n square process by basically reusing your old p from time step n, then using this little formula to include a new data point, and then you get p n plus one as an update. And from that, you can actually update your uh, parameter vector w. Not very complicated, this is how it is. The interesting thing is there's no matrix inversion anymore. And this little gamma thing is a forgetting factor. I'll come back to this in a second, but just assume it's one for the moment. <coughs> it doesn't even exist. Um, so this process now basically says with every new data point, I just do have a square computational cost operator to update and put a new data point in there. And I don't have to deal with matrix inverse anymore. But there's nothing for free, OK? Just because you don't see the matrix inversion doesn't mean it's not there. It is in there. And it has the same problems. If you would get data points which are ill-conditioned, that means don't fill the entire space, which you need to invert this kind of matrix, um, recursively scarce will give you the same problems. The good thing is recursively scarce gives you literally analytically exactly the same solution as this equation. So if you put n data points or recursively squares, it comes up with the same result as if you used this analytical equation to solve. So it's kind of nice. All of this is based on the Sherman Morris and Woodbury theorem or the matrix inversion theorem, which basically shows you how to basically, this is, this is kind of the key component. Here's our old matrix P, and we add a new data point to it, and then we invert it. Actually, it's not P, so A would be uh, X transpose X. X transpose X, here comes a data point to it, and just tells you how to basically add this data point by using the inverse of A, which you had before. It, it's, this is a most important theorem to derive a lot of statistical things in life. Don't want to go into this, but you should just know that it exists just in case you ever wanted it. Um, forgetting factors. So the interesting thing could be that you have a system which drifts over time. Again, the idea is maybe you have a rocket which loses fuel all the time. And then you have to basically estimate a changing mark. The way you can do this is basically you get data points, one data point at a time, but you say, I want to start discounting older data points, and I want to trust new data points more. And this is where this lambda comes in. If you put this lambda not equal one, but rather something like 0.999 or something like that, you will start forgetting data over time. The idea is essentially it's like an exponential downgrading of data points. Where basically, if you look at time, there should so it's like this, this is time, and this is the weight of, and this is my current time. All the old, so my, my current data point gets the highest weight, and all the other ones basically get downgraded like this. Not negative, um, should be all positive. Actually, one little fun thing. You can actually figure out how many data points are actually considered when you have a forgetting factor by just computing one over one minus lambda. This is the equivalent of data points which you're having. So let's say if lambda equals 0 0.99, then I, when I compute this, it's one minus 0 0.99 is 0 0.01. So this is 100. So with 0.99, I basically consider equivalent of 100 data points in my forgetting. It's not a lot. You know, a robotic system running at a 500 hertz loop or whatever, that means after one second I've forgotten everything. So that's not a particularly good lambda. So you quickly need something like 0.9999 or something like that to make this horizon correct. So these are little things how to reason about these things. Okay. So what is good about recursively squares? So it basically gets exactly the same solution as analytically closed formally squares, no matrix inversion, there is no learning rates or anything which you have in some gradient descent algorithms. It will give you the optimal parameters as linear regression will always do. Um, forgetting factor allows you to forget things. Computational load is for incremental updating better than recomputing the complete matrix inversion but don't get fooled, so you're still doing a matrix inversion implicitly and has the same problems as normal matrix inversions have. Okay, so 
Fine. Oh, God, I lost my video stream over there. Not entirely, but a little bit. Um, let's see. Now we have, essentially, we have model reference adaptive control, where you basically do parameter adaptation, adaptation and control at the same time it guarantees that you converge to an optimal solution within what you've been formulating. We talked about self-tuning regulators where you estimate something, usually assuming then that what you estimate is the correct thing and design a controller based on that. And these estimation techniques, techniques usually use least squares regression in some forms, it's mm -hmm. not recursive least squares. These are the most common and standard methods and there's textbooks out of there how to do estimation based on that. Um, last but not least, there's obviously other schemes for adaptive control which people have been developing. So one of them, okay, that should be a thumb sign, has changed. It's actually feedback error learning, which is kind of an interesting idea. Basically, you have a robot and a feedback, a negative feedback controller, just a regular PD controller, and then you have a model. And basically, you use as long, and this model basically adds a model command as well. So if this model were perfect, the feedback controller wouldn't have to do anything. It would have just very minimal effort, since your error for your tracking error would be zero all the time. If it's not zero, that means that your inverse model is not good enough, and you can basically use the PV error, so the PD error, and put them into a learning system and basically um, have the learning system minimize minimize um, this PD error through some parameter adaptation process. This has been called feedback error learning by some researchers in Japan 20, 30 years ago. It's kind of an interesting uh, model how you can basically use directly control inputs from a feedback controller and use them to adapt the model. You can prove that this actually works and is stable, but it also has all kinds of problems how to set the PD gains. It turns out the PD gains which are good for control are not necessarily the, the gains which guarantee convergence of your model learning, interestingly. So these are just technical results which people came up over time. And obviously, if you want to learn generic nonlinear models, you can just basically, so we are now basically going away. We have before x dot equals ax plus b of u. Now let's get rid of this and simply say x dot equals f of x of u, so a totally generic nonlinear model. Um, if you want to learn a generic nonlinear model like this, that means you have to learn the function f, you have to go into nonlinear function approximation. Gradient descent methods are a generic way how to do that. If you have a generic, you have to forget about this. This is essentially deriving just gradient descent, not, not a big deal problem. Um, these days, actually, what people like to use for model estimation is Gaussian process regression a lot because it's a, it's a nice method. If you don't have too many data points, it's basically the same as linear regression where you have, for every data point, you have a parameter. And then you unfortunately have to very soon be the kind of inverted matrix, which has a few thousand data points. You can try that, take MATLAB, and see how big a matrix you can invert before MATLAB says it runs out of computational power or memory or whatever. All right, um, so these are kind of the basics of adaptive control. This is actually the most beautiful thing you could do if you could do it reliably. And it's beautifully developed in linear systems and it becomes miserable in nonlinear systems, unfortunately. And learning controllers on interesting robots are incredibly rare. Nobody dares running them on a daily basis. People are worried that you learn something and you start diverging. Um, just one little example, which you find, if you just do linear regression, again, linear regression was this beautiful thing where you have data points and you fit a line through it, this is X and Y. So these are nice data points, so I check gave you, friendly, all of that. But what happens if suddenly your sensor does something nasty 
and you get this data point. A linear regression is incredibly sensitive to that. So it has that nice slope, you get this data point, and the new slope you get estimated and almost like that. It completely screws you up. And you know, creating bad data points in a robot is actually not very hard, or kind of complicated data points. Since if you, if you have like a humanoid robot and you're touching things, you get suddenly all the kind of changes in the model which you're dealing with. So this is my normal movement model. The moment I'm touching here, I have a completely different movement model. If I now use this data while I'm touching to include in my, my model which I want to estimate, it completely changes and screws me up. So you start needing a lot of if-then statements, or maybe you need very good touch sensors which tell you about the state of your robot to adjust and know what is a good data point or not, or outlier detection methods, or all kinds of things. The problem is, you know, you have a nice little walking system. You get this data point, you include it in your model, you recompute your controller, and you're dead. As simple as that. And that's kind of why people don't use it so far in a coherent and, and interesting way. All right, that was it. So Thursday will be project preparation. See you then. Please, please, please.